Science and technology define the way we live our lives. In just the last 50 years, technologies like the computer or the internet have completely transformed our society and have changed the way the world works. No one knows for certain what the next big technological revolution will be, but chances are good that it's coming. In making this film, we wanted to hear from some scientists about where they thought science and technology were headed and about the scientific enterprise as a whole. We asked them to think big picture, not about the next three or five years, but about the next 30 years or 50 years. We weren't interested in what they thought about 2015. We wanted them to think about the year 2050. Science is moving so rapidly right now, I think science is going to move even more rapidly. And science fact is going to catch up with science fiction in the next 20 and definitely in the next 40 years. And we need to think about where we want to sit in this plane. I think the next major technology is going to probably come from biology. I think that some of the advances in science are taking us to a place where we could create organisms from scratch. Well, we're already creating organisms by mixing and matching parts from lots of different species in the living world and combining them like tinker toys in order to make uh, hybrids of lots of different species. When you say that, people tend to think that you're talking about some Neanderthal-like thing. I don't think it would be true for a primate at this point today. However, for various sorts of plants or insects, I think that technology already exists. With the possibility that we can now create genomes from scratch and just write down whatever sequence we want, we can now take big leaps in uh, biological space um, and get to things, at least conceivably, that you could never get to through an evolutionary means. Nobody knows how to do that, but it is conceivable, and I think in the next few years that's something people will start working on. Everyone we spoke to talked about this emerging revolution in biology, of our growing mastery of how living things work. And these technologies have a profound potential to impact the human condition in ways we can predict and in some ways we can't. If we can essentially understand our DNA, we can in principle, understand almost any illness. We can understand ourselves at the most basic biological level. And that's sort of one, you know, one of the major drives of biology right now, is to try and understand you know, how we operate, how we work, why cancer you know, exists, why do we get Alzheimer's. So the fact that now we can engineer all types of biological systems from scratch, going from molecules to cells to tissues, will provide a whole new way to treat disease. So for someone who's having heart failure, to be able to re-engineer that person a heart is a very good use of that type of technology. I think what's important is that there is some thoughtfulness that goes into what are the things that we want to engineer and who's going to keep an eye on what's being engineered. We have to be extra careful about not over-extrapolating, especially before any sort of application, either in the area of medicine or biocontrol. We have to be very, very careful that we have, to the extent we can, try to understand what are the possible impacts of what we're doing on the world around us, that we, not, we don't create a monster. I think we're going to find that, as we have many times in the past, we are going to have a younger generation that's very unconcerned about exploring and permanently changing their bodies. And what we're going to find is, whether it's okay or not, we're going to find people starting to experiment. This has a lot of ethical questions, okay, but also you can learn a lot about how to heal people and how to understand uh, disease. These people all had a real passion for their work, not just for science as a body of knowledge, but for science as a way of knowing things. And they all seemed concerned about the question of how science and society interact. Science gives us options. It gives us tools with which we can change the physical world, and it gives us predictive power to make predictions about what's going to happen if we take some action. It doesn't tell us what to do. I think one of the big questions we're going to have to ask ourselves as a society is, you know, what do we want? What are we striving for? You know, and what, what do we value in this world? Science isn't just about learning facts and taking a test. Science is about all of us making decisions about how we're going to live our lives. 
I think people need to understand that. People, people need to start appreciating science, you know, beyond sort of like the, the you know, I'm doing biology, physics, or chemistry, or, or this. You're not doing any of these things. You're learning how to think like a scientist. With any new technology, there will be winners and there will be losers. And the more powerful science becomes, the more important it is for society to engage in the conversation about what we want. Because science and technology is not just a reflection of what we want, it's a reflection of what we value. By changing the way we train scientists, by improving their capacity to understand what it means to build things that go out into the world, we can get a, a new generation of scientists that is at least recognizing this and can help shape the stuff that they do as they're doing it. And so I think it's not about looking down on science and deciding what is right and wrong, but it's about building a generation of scientists that can do that themselves and, and maybe the things that we think that are bad won't actually ever be built. I feel like I can uniquely contribute. You know, I feel like I can leave my mark in the world. I can have an influence in the world. I can uh, be admired for what I do. I can, I can you know, I can create something. <laughs> And sort of it's this sense of, you know, getting up every day and like figuring out a problem or figuring out a question that I want, you know, the solution to. And knowing that my answer to this question has implications, that it can have an impact in society is extremely fulfilling. In the end, the scientists didn't have all the answers and they seemed to recognize that. No one knows what the world will be like in 2050 because we haven't built that world yet. And scientists and engineers won't build it alone. Hopefully, we will all be part of the conversation about what kind of society we want and what kind of society we need. It's often said that people need to know more about science. And that's true, but science also needs to know more about people. Creating the future isn't just about equations and experiments. It's about imagination and ingenuity and the sense of excitement and wonder. Scientists will never have all the answers. They need philosophers and artists and poets and dreamers of all ages. Whatever future we make, we all have a chance to make it together. So let's make it bright. <laughs>